This is the Shoah story of Federica Frieda Rice, née Hamburger, and her family. Frieda was born in 1941 in Yugoslavia, today's Croatia, and then occupied by Mussolini's fascist Italy. During the years of the Shoah, her family escaped to Switzerland. It is a personal story based upon memories and a few surviving photographs. Similarly, to portray the context and the historical background of both World War II and the Holocaust, the persecution and murder of approximately 6 million Jews in Europe and beyond, the producers also used archival materials. The producers are grateful for the assistance of the historians and friends, as well as museums and other research institutes that provided access to private collections and archives. Please note the credits at the end of this film. We apologize for the sometimes poor quality of the historic photographs. Please note that this film was produced for private, educational and non-commercial purposes by a team of volunteers. It is not intended for commercial distribution. The producers hope that this case history of a lesser known episode of the Shoah will contribute to a deeper and more expansive understanding of the horrific events of the Holocaust. The German Wehrmacht occupies northern Italy. Thousands of refugees attempt to enter neutral Switzerland. After the German occupation of Italy in September 1943, over 4,500 refugees were admitted from early September 1943 until March 1944. A total of 12,154 civilians found refuge in Switzerland. The number of rejected refugees is controversial. This movie is all about survival to regain human dignity. It's about escaping Nazi horror and physical extermination. Imagine, it would happen today. You would be excluded, defamed, humiliated, marginalized, persecuted. You are forced by racial law to wear the Jewish badge. The risk of you being arrested is extreme. You would be deported. Maybe first to a prison or a ghetto or directly moved to a concentration camp to be divided into male, female and into fit or unfit for work, but eventually to be brutally murdered. With luck, you would succeed to escape, to survive at any price. All means are justified. You would hide. No place is too unworthy for that. Change your identity as Frieda's parents did and use different names so that no one would know you by your real name. Frieda's father was Giuseppe Molinari from Mola di Bari, Giuseppe Rizzo from Pordenone, Giuseppe Avanzi from Forlì. Her mother was Maria Chiesa from Genova, Maria Chiesa from Verbania Piemonte, Luisa Melenza from Padano. If recognized, you would be arrested and deported. That would probably be your death sentence. The success of your escape would depend on the local anti-government population's help putting themselves in mortal danger. Cautiously, you move towards the country, not at war, hoping to finally live in freedom and security. But the official border crossings are closed to refugees. You would be turned back and handed over to your henchmen. Locals would take you to an illegal border crossing via surreptitious routes. It is up to you to master the last meters to safety. With these introductory slides, we wanted to delve with you into the life-threatening path that Jews and all other refugees had to take to save their lives, 
accompanied by the constant fear of being caught and eventually murdered. Never, never again. This is the core message of the following story. My name is Federica Reis. In my wildest dreams ever could I have imagined that one day I would be watching a documentary based on my memories of survival of our small family during World War II. My story, and of course, the thousands of other Holocaust stories and testimonies are of enormous educational value for future generations. With this movie, my descendants will be connected to the history of our generation. They are part of it. Marked by dramatic situations, hiding and fleeing, trying to stay out of harm's way, I experienced the time of the Shoah as a very young child together with my parents. I was namely born into it during a curfew in a time of crisis. Do I remember those times? Consciously, definitely not. As my parents tried to offer me a life as close to normal as possible, I started to ask questions as soon as I could talk. Why was the most popular word in my limited vocabulary? It seemed things did not make sense to me. My mother related to me later. In the years to come, my dear mother never missed an occasion to talk about those terrifying times. We children should never forget. I still hear her voice in my ears when I think back. Never again should such a tragedy befall humanity. Never again. My family was blessed to make it to the Swiss southern border and allowed to enter into Switzerland, where we would find safety from the German army and their neo-fascist Italian allies. As much as our story is special to me and my family, we share the Shoah experience with thousands of others, some with happy ending, many more unfortunately ending tragically. 1943, when we reached the Swiss border, there was a rush of refugees. Switzerland, which was not at war, had closed its border, claiming the boat was full. The guards had orders to reject the one seeking asylum. Deserted and disarmed soldiers from other armies were admitted, protected by the Geneva Convention. Some Swiss guards blatantly disregarded the orders and helped save lives out of compassion following their own moral standards at great personal risks for their own lives. The story of our passage to safety is a miracle, and I will always be thankful. Today, I'm grateful for the opportunity given to me to remind all to never forget and always stay vigilant. I'm grateful for every day and enjoy my family together with my dear husband. Shoeboxes, tell me your secrets a traumatic family story of miraculous survival. The odyssey of Frida's family's survival during World War II started 1933 in Berlin and ended miraculously at the Swiss border of Stabio. Its story had been stashed away in three shoeboxes in her father's wardrobe. Silent testimony of her parents' ingenuity to survive the hardships of World War II. She remembers the yellow star badge that her father had also been forced to wear while he lived in Czechoslovakia. As you saw in the introduction, the parents used forged ID cards with different times and locations, different names, dates and places of birth, all with official stamps issued by the Italian Resistenza, the underground authority fighting against the fascist Italian government. These ID cards were their ultimate lifesavers. My parents of blessed memory, Zagreb, 1940. My father, Josef Akiba 
hamburger of blessed memory. My father, Josef Hamburger, may he rest in peace, was German. Left Germany in 1933 after coming to power of the Hitler regime and lived in different European countries to avoid the advancing Nazi occupation. In Czechoslovakia, inv invaded by the Germans in 1939, his passport got the J for Jews stamped on it. And he had to wear the yellow badge. My mother, Regina Beba, Hamburger ne Herskovic of blessed memory. Zagreb, 1940. A city with about 11,000 Jews out of around 80,000 Jews in all of Yugoslavia. This according to Yad Vashem. Prior to World War II, there was an active Jewish life in Zagreb. Apparently, Zagreb was the preeminent community of Yugoslavia. In 1941, this radically changed. The synagogue was totally destroyed. My parents married in June 1940 in Zagreb. Did they sense that their lives would change completely a few months later? The beginning. In April 1941, the Germans invaded Yugoslavia. They strictly imposed the racial laws and started to capture and deport the Jews. This picture is from Belgrade. According to Yad Vashem, approximately 65,000 Yugoslavian Jews were murdered. Yugoslavia was divided between Germany and its allies, Italy, Bulgaria and Hungary. Zagreb was then part of the new state of Croatia ruled by the fascist Ustaše movement, the brutal pro-German nationalists. The Ustaše regime soon enforced hard anti-Jewish regulations. In Zagreb, Jews were forced to identify themselves as Jews. The Croatian Ustaše regime forced Jews to wear armbands with the letter Z for Zidov, the word for Jew in Croatian. Families fled, finding refuge in Italian-occupied areas. Ustaje, Croatian fascist camp guards, order a Jewish man to remove his ring before being shot. The concentration of Croatian Jews in camps began in June 1941. By the end of that year, about two-thirds of Croatia's Jews had been sent to those camps where most of them were murdered on arrival. The Germans deported the remaining Jews from Croatia to Auschwitz. First miracle. After a few days of being married, Frieda's father was arrested as a German spy in Zagreb and sent to the only German labor camp in the Julian Alps. There, he was recognized by a German officer who revealed himself as an old schoolmate in Berlin, not a Nazi. He liberated him and sent him back to his wife in Zagreb. Whilst Frieda's father survived, the young officer did not make it. A new blessing. 1941, Frieda's father left Zagreb soon after for the town of Split on the Adriatic coast. Here, you see the train station. Split was ruled by Mussolini's fascist Italy. Many Jews from Austria, Germany, and other parts of Nazi-occupied Yugoslavia were seeking refuge along the beautiful Adriatic coast. Hitler agreed to leave territories to Italy, such as Dalmatia, that once had belonged to the Roman Empire. The city of Split became Italian again. The locals spoke Italian anyway. The Italian name of Split was Spolato. Frida's mother followed her husband a few days later. The train she was on suddenly stopped. An informant had advised the police of a Jewess on the train, but she was not found. The couple was reunited. This event turned out to be Frida's first adventure since her mother was pregnant with her. The Jews and Mussolini. 
How did the Jewish population fare under Mussolini and his fascists? Mussolini ruled Italy before and during the war period until 1943. In the beginning, the Jews were left alone. Some were even enthusiastic supporters. The tide turned by the mid-1930s when Mussolini sensed that the wind was shifting in Europe and that war by Nazi Germany with democratic Europe was inevitable. Mussolini formed an alliance with Hitler. From 1938, he adopted the anti-Jewish Nazi racial laws in a soft form. Jews were limited in their civil rights, but could remain in their homes. Their assets were not confiscated, nor were they herded into concentration camps. But the soft persecution was transformed into something much worse in the fall of 1943, when the Germans occupied the northern half of the country. Times get harder. In April 1941, following the invasion of Yugoslavia by Nazi Germany, Split was occupied by Italy. One month later, on the 18th of May 1941, Italy formally annexed Split, which was included in the province of Spalato. At this time, according to the Encyclopedia Judaica, around 400 Jews were living in Split. Some were refugees from Austria, Czechoslovakia, etc. Italian fascists ransacked the synagogue and destroyed various religious objects and burned books. This is the place in the center of Split where it happened. Hitler heard how Mussolini was giving better treatment to the Jews in Italy compared to other occupied countries. Hitler wanted them to work in his war machine. Mussolini agreed first for the non-Italian Jews, but later stated that he did not have the trains to move them. Hitler offered to help Mussolini. Mazel tov, we are a family. The city of Sparata was under curfew for days at a time. This was the situation when I was born on November 13, 1941. Their neighbor was an Italian officer with a chauffeur. He had offered to take the future mother to the clinic. So she was driven to the hospital during a curfew by an Italian soldier who had the order to stay and wait until after the birth. He brought the father a note that they were parents to a little girl. A week later, he brought mother and baby home. Things were getting complicated. It was time to flee again. The only open route was by sea. Our way out. Frida's father located a fishing boat that had an extra cabin, ready to take them against an upfront payment of 3,000 US dollars, a trip which today would take a few hours only. The family lived shortly in Trieste. There were demonstrations against Nazi Germany. 1942, Italian fascist squads vandalized and devastated the synagogue. During the Nazi occupation, until 1945, the synagogue was used as a deposit for books and works of art looted from Jewish houses. The ritual silverware of the community was saved from plunder thanks to a clever hiding place inside the very building. As soon as the war was over, the synagogue went back into operation. From Trieste to Asti, Germany invaded Italy, chasing the Jews. They were on their way to a new destination, Asti. January 1943. They enjoyed the friendliness of the Italian people who hid them with families in Italian towns and cities and provided them with forged documents. There were a few months of relative calm, but Mussolini was losing Hitler's trust. A coup d'etat was orchestrated to depose Mussolini and set him under house arrest in the Apennine Mountains. Pietro Badoglio, a general faithful to the Nazis, became prime minister. 1943, life changed overnight. The Italian regime was overtly chasing the Jews and allowed the German army 
to invade Italy to impose strict adherence to the racial laws. The arrest of all Jews was ordered. They were harassed, rounded up, and incarcerated. After the Italian surrender in September, Italian Jews living in the areas occupied by the Germans were included in the scope of the racial laws. According to Yad Vashem, they were approximately 44,500. Approximately 12,000 were deported to the National Transit Camp of Fasoli and from there to Auschwitz to die. Only very few returned. Saved in coffins. They were living in Asti, the birthplace of General Pietro Badoglio. The mother was pregnant again and her doctor advised her not to leave on the overcrowded trains to nowhere. She would jeopardize her life as well as the babies. The population was not very sympathetic to the new regime. The authorities decided to seek help from the teachers. Their pupils were instructed to inquire and report about any Jew living or hiding in their neighborhood. So, one late evening, there was a knock at the door. It was a neighbor. His son had asked about the family's whereabouts. The father came to warn them and apologized for the situation. The police came looking for them several times, but they did not find them. They had been warned on time and disappeared in empty coffins that were piled outside the building. The Italian policeman would not open a coffin. Superstition had its positive side. The delivery was due very soon and travel was not on the cards. The mother confided in her doctor. He told her to go home, pack and come with her family to the city hospital where he was the head physician and administrator. He would prefer an operating theatre to be used by the three of them cleared out of all medical equipment. The idea was brilliant. Since this was not a hospital room, there was no need to register them as patients. My brother Roberto, may he rest in peace, was born on September 26, 1943 in Asti. The police, still looking for us, we were informed that the hospital would be inspected from the basement to the attic. On October 1st, 1943, we were on our go again. Now, with a five-day-old newborn and the mother still very weak, a car picked them up and drove them to the next town to spend the night. The quest to reach the only country not at war in Europe, Switzerland, was nearing reality. They traveled always closer to the border, by car, by foot, rarely by train. The Jewish highest holiday was starting. On the eve of Yom Kippur at 6 p.m., they were still on the streets of Varese, curfew starting any moment and no place for the night. When the father saw the sign reading, Hotel, they ventured inside and were greeted by an elderly lady who understood that something was wrong with them. She motioned to stay silent and rushed them up the staircase to the attic to a fully furnished suite. Then she left to return with her sister. They provided warm water, sheets, diapers, food, milk, and semolina. The next morning, the parents realized that they were living in the entrance house of the Villa Concordia in the middle of a huge park which had been requisitioned by the German Border Police Command in Varese, including the Gestapo. At night, they had missed seeing the swastika flag hanging along the facade of the building. Later, they learned that the villa's park was used as a collection point for Jewish prisoners destined for prisoners in the area and later for deportation. After Yom Kippur, the father went out to look for people who would help find guides to take them to Switzerland. He rode his bike to a village where he was told the priest was the head of a strictly illegal organization that helped people to reach the Swiss border. When he tried to explain his problem, the priest chased and cursed him, menacing to alert the police. The father had met the wrong priest. 
he went back to the young priest who helped them to get to the border. The mother being weak and Frieda at 23 months, they had to choose the easiest path. They had to pay a stipulated amount that would also allow 10 soldiers, prisoners of war, who were able to escape from Italian jails to join them. The soldiers would be granted asylum under the Geneva Convention. Weather, rain, cold, heavy fog covers the way to the Swiss border. They were still on the Italian side, which was occupied by the Germans, but they already saw the house of the Swiss guards. Driven to the foot of the hill, they would have to climb. To reach the fortified, closed and permanently guarded Swiss border under observation by the Nazi guards. They met the 10 escapees and decided to split into two groups. One would take the steeper, shorter way uphill. The other, the easier serpentine through the forest, hopefully meeting at the electrified barbed wire Swiss border. Papiri, documenti. The mother carrying Roberto, 19 days old, and the father and Frida started their ascent when German border guards spotted them. What are you doing here? Where are you going? Papier, documenti. We are farmers. I am taking my wife and the children to her relatives in Switzerland. Uh, we do not have enough food. I plan to come back uh, tomorrow to tend uh, the farm. Well, tell me, how old is the baby? Three months. I am a father too. Follow us. Wait a minute. Your soldiers are taking the shortcut that is very steep. This is too difficult for my little daughter and also for my wife. I suggest you follow your soldiers and we will go down in the long way. At the bottom, there is a bus station. We will meet there. All right? He orders them to follow his soldiers to the police station down in the valley. If their documents and story proved to be true, they would be free to go wherever they wished to. He might still be waiting. Swiss border. We Swiss are humane. As already mentioned, the parents had each three different, all equally legal IDs in six pockets that the mother had sewn into the lining of the father's raincoat. The last chance to reach Switzerland was vanishing. Come quickly, look, 100 meters, maybe a little more, the electrified Swiss border. The father, a skilled luggage maker who graduated as a saddler, had a plier to cut the barbed wire. Soon, the 10 soldiers reunited with them. They crossed the border, started walking, soon realizing that they had lost their orientation. They decided to sit on a Swiss milestone and wait. After a while, a uniformed man on a horse emerged from the fog. Swiss or German? He was Swiss, alerted by the cut in the fence and was inspecting the border. After checking everyone's documents, he took the escaped soldiers with him. The family would stay there in the rain. What they will happen to us? You will almost certainly be sent back to where you came from. So shoot us, kill us. Being sent back means our 100% death sentence. The father told him about the scary encounter they had met and told the officer to shoot them there and then. We Swiss are humane. He left and the family remained sitting on the milestone. Sometimes later, soldiers showed up to take them to the next village to the police station. The place was Stabio, in the Italian-speaking Swiss canton of Ticino. This was the official border to Italy. They were finally on the safe side. After some inquiry and telephone calls to people the parents knew in Switzerland and who would vouch for them, they were admitted to stay for the time being. The official recognition as refugees came some time later. Safe, thankful, but
but uncertain as refugees. After the extremely dramatic experiences before and while entering Swiss territory and the official confirmation as a refugee family, a new phase of life begins for the Hamburger family. Safe, grateful, but with all the uncertainties that come with the refugee status in an unknown country. The following short sequences summarize the important episodes of this not always an easy time. It was not until 1950 that the family received its final settlement permit. Mother and children were taken to the hospital of Bellinzona, today's capital of the canton of Ticino, to recover. The father was sent to a camp for men in Gudo, a large internment camp Swiss military authorities had set up in southern Switzerland. The majority of the camp inmates worked in agriculture. The father befriended a priest who agreed to be the messenger between the parents. He found the hospital where mother and children were housed. In this way, the parents could exchange letters. But the father was not allowed to travel, not even to attend Roberto's Brit Mila, the Jewish ritual of circumcision. The authorities at the Stabio border crossing, in addition to inquiring about the movements of the German army on their escape, also inquired about the financial situation of the family, which enabled Switzerland to avoid paying for them. Thus, the Hamburgers lived in a requisitioned hotel, a camp for refugees able to foot the bill in Lugano, Paradiso. Here is the picture of a hotel invoice that is stored in the Swiss Federal Archives. To pay the hotel bill, the father had to ask each month permission from the authorities to retrieve money from his bank account. After a few months, in December 1943, they were sent to another new military facility home for displaced people and soldiers near Lausanne. From this official registration form, we see that Frieda's father was there only for a short time, but mother and children stayed for several weeks until Pesach 1944. A surprise was in the air. After all the difficult weeks in Haldiman, the camp manager decided that the family would qualify to find their own housing. One caveat, they had to return to the canton of Ticino where they got permission to enter the country. Around June 1944, they found a small accommodation in Ruvigliana, overlooking Lugano, which they had to share with the owner of the house. They remained there until the end of October 1950. A neighbor gave them a baby bed for Roberto, the baby brother, but no bed for Frida, only a mattress. The father did not want Frida to sleep on the floor. He collected enough old newspapers to stack under the mattress so that she had a bed too, a very special one. 1945, end of the war. The parents had no country to go back to. Germany was no option and Yugoslavia had become communist. On the 20th of May, 1945, only a few days after the end of the war, the family received an expulsion order to return to Yugoslavia. Here is the wording. They were to report to the departure camp in St. Margrethen, Canton St. Gallen, on the 23rd of August, 1945, at half past four in the afternoon. The letter says, this repatriation of all Yugoslav refugees present in Switzerland takes place in agreement with the Allied authorities. But the Hamburgers were finally able to stay in Switzerland. By then, all their money was spent. They had applied for US immigration papers and were supposed to embark in Genoa in January 1947. But in December 1946, the mother became ill with tuberculosis in both lungs needing treatment in a specialized sanatorium, highly contagious. The children ended up in foster care. They had to change schools. It took two years for the mother to heal and return back home. The mother had written to the Department of Interior 
that the Labour Department denied refugees the right to an income, but they couldn't move anywhere. She needed to be near medical resources. They answered that the father should look for a position and would get a permit if no Swiss had his qualifications. Having found a tiny ad from a commodity company in London for a representative with his expertise, he applied successfully. In 1950, their status was normalized to stateless foreigners with permits of residency and work, their rebirth. In November, the Hamburgers moved to Lugano to their first apartment. Frida's mother had to be careful, but things were improving. Her health situation had speeded up the normalization of the family status. Life lesson, forgive, but never forget. These were the words of Frida's father. They guided her all her life. All her recollections are from memories and the daily recounts of her mother. And of course, the father's shoe boxes, which in Frida's eyes were a treasure trove. Unfortunately, they disappeared and were never found again. The fourth shoe box for next generations. Frida's family story will continue. With God's help, it will go on from generation to generation. What is the secret of the fourth shoebox? The late Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs said, a family narrative connects children to something larger than themselves. It helps them make sense of how they fit into the world that existed before they were born. It enables children to say, this is who I am. This is the story of which I am part. These are the people who came before me and whose descendant I am. No matter how difficult family life stories were, they must be known. May the next generation keep them alive. With this prayer, we end Frida's moving family story.